Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of On the Shoulders of Giants with Rabbi Shmuel Bloom. Today, we're going to be talking about how the vision and determination of Rabbi Meisha Sherer changed the face of American Orthodoxy forever. Starting at a young age with Agudas Yisrael of America, Rabbi Meisha Sherer fought battle after battle, going head-to-head with the Italian Mafia, suing New York State and winning, and so much more. He became great friends with mayors, governors, even with presidents such as Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. Before we start, make sure you go to our YouTube channel. Make sure you are subscribed because we are working on a few new projects that are going to start a little bit after Sukkot. So stay tuned for that. Now let's get to today's episode. I'm Yisrael Yudkowski. You are listening to the Foundations Podcast. Well, it was a schus, a really big schus, to be able to work with Rabbi Sher almost on a daily basis for uh, 25 years. Uh, almost every day I was in contact with him. Uh, to discuss uh, what was going on, what needed to be done, and uh, to follow through on it. And I really think that HaKadosh Baruch Hu B'chastai, um gave us, after the Second World War, when we were decimated, uh, six million Jews killed, the leadership of, of Klai Yisrael for the most part. Uh, and now it had to be transformed or transferred to another continent, to the United States, um, and Eretz Yisrael. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the gift of a few G'dayli Yisrael who were able to bring the spirit that was got saved from, from, from the Hurban in Europe, and they were able to come and, I wouldn't say recreate, but create a new um, uh, Torah community and, and, and fit the Torah community into, into uh, the, 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 the American scene we'll, we'll talk about today. But in addition to the daily Yisrael, who built the Torah and built the Torah community in uh, after the Second World War, HaKadosh Baruch gave us a certain number of individuals to build our nation. And one of those gifts that HaKadosh Baruch gave us was the gift of Ramesh Hashir. Multi-talented, multifaceted. He was able to write. He was able to speak. He was able to charm people. He had his special Nesia Schein um, to be able to, to, to get people a, a, an achrayis or feeling of responsibility, responsibly for Kali responsibly for Kiddushem Shemayim, and an understanding how on an organizational basis how to build that. And with those talents and those abilities, he used those to build Agudas Yisrael specifically, but generally build the Torah community in in, 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 in in the country after the Second World War. Now, his, um, his Nesiyah Schein was to a broad, broad uh, a group of people. I remember uh, we got a call from the Yeshiva in Tells. Um, the Yeshiva in Tells had an annual fundraising campaign with Hanukkah candles. And Hanukkah candles, um, uh, I don't remember if you get the uh, Hanukkah candles from Telzi Yeshiva with an envelope, uh, and everybody, every home they got, it was, it was a major, major fundraiser for, 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 uh, uh, for Telzi Yeshiva. Telzi Yeshiva got the candles imported from Eretz Yisrael, and they came by boat. And they came to the boat a few months before uh, Hanukkah, and they were going to send it out. Uh, they had to ship it to Cleveland to be able to ship it out. And there was a strike at the port. And the unions were striking, and nothing was going on or off the boats. Okay, so who do you call? Call Rabbi Sher. Okay. They got a call from, um, from, from Cleveland. Uh, the executive director of the yeshiva in, 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 tells the yeshiva in Cleveland, call it's a, a problem. There was, we, we have to get these, you have to go to the boats, and they say that nothing goes on roof. Rabbi Sharon makes a couple of phone calls and finds out nothing's going on on roof. He says, the, the longshoremen, mafia people, he says, they're in charge, and they're not letting anything go on and off the boats, and that could be a major loss of money for Tulsi Yeshiva. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's their it, annual main fundraiser. At that point, were their major fundraiser, if not their main fundraiser. 
and uh, and and the candles are on the boat, and you can't use um, candles, some Hanukkah candles for Pesach, right? It's, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. you, need it, yeah. right? <laughs> you need it for there. So they called Rabbi Shera, and Rabbi Shera had an idea in the labor department in the New York State Labor Department that he worked with on for Shabbos laws and other problems that the, that people had. He had become friendly with uh, an, an Italian uh, politician. And that politician, that uh, Italian, had good friends in the mafia. Mm. The Italian mafia, of course. Yeah. <laughs> right. And Rabbi Shera called him up and said to him, you know, there's a problem, tell the yeshiva, Hanukkah candles, it's Hanukkah. So, so um, he says, I'm sorry, nothing's going on and off the boat. So they said, let's think about it. He said, and then he had the siyat of the Shemaya to come up with, uh, um, he said, how about perishables? How about something that's going to, if there was lettuce on the boat, and the lettuce would be ruined, the tomatoes, the lettuce on tomatoes, he says, well, that's an exception. We make an exception by perishable, something that's going to be perishable, they're going to lose it, so then mm-hmm. uh, then, then, uh, then, they make the exception then, and say that... Uh, um, we must ask him to bring it in. We ask him to bring it out because probably otherwise could it's going to get lost. Lawsuits, 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 So Rabbi Sher explained to him that Hanukkah candles before Hanukkah are perishables. Is if we don't get it off the boat, it's, you can throw it in the you can throw it in the sea. He says it has no value. So he says, let me take it over. So he went back, spoke to the mafia bosses. Or he came back. He says, okay, Rabbi Sher, but somebody has to go down to the port to take it off. So um, uh, Rabbi Sher says, I'm not going to go. He calls no, the executive the director. Italian and mafia to go mafia. deal with them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Rabbi Sher calls the executive director, tells Yeshiva, says, get on a plane, get here to New York. You're going to, to the port to, explain, to request that they should take these perishable candles off, mm-hmm. off the boat. So he goes down there, and sure enough, they... Uh, take the candles off the boat, they put the truck on the truck, and they said, how much do I owe the longshoreman for taking it off? He said, uh, no, you don't owe anything. This is a special gift for the Jewish godfather, hmm. Rabbi Shera, the Jewish godfather. Yeah. Right? So, so, so he had that type of connection. He, he was able to, to relate to these types of people and to, uh, to relate. To, um, he was able to tell a secretary with charm how to staple a, a letter and he was able to tell Rudy Giuliani when he was running for mayor of New York um, at a meeting, he says, you know why you're not going to win? Because you don't smile enough. He says, you should smile more. You too, look too angry. And Giuliani used to say that. He says, I remember Rabbi Sher when he came to a meeting and he says, I started smiling and I won the election. <laughs> I, I listened to his advice. Wow. He talked about his listen to, to you, Carrie. See, he was able to talk to people of all different backgrounds, all different and be able to be nice Yeah, it's be so beautiful so that they had that respect, like actually listen to. So I'm sure especially politicians, they have, every second of the day, they have a million people, oh, you should do this, do that. They, you know, they have their team, to, you know, the way they work, advertisements, this and that, speeches, right. what to say, what not to say, and, you know, that's what I do. But to actually have that, you know, that influence that the politicians should, you know, like Rudy Giuliani, you know, especially now with old Donald Trump, is like, who doesn't know Rudy Giuliani, you know? So, yeah, yeah you know, to have the Italian mafia, you know, like all this stuff, like actually like respect him enough to like listen to him. And he, and he had the siyat of the shmaya to be able to know the right thing to say at the right time. So um, the, uh, for instance, he got a call from Eric Tesoro, um, the Ger Rebbe especially, was very, very upset was the fact that they were building a big Mormon church in Yerushalayim. And they were afraid it was going to be a missionary, a home for missionaries. Um, the Mormons uh, try to convince people to, to follow their religion. And in Eretz where children, many children go to have a decent chinuch, they don't know what it's about. And here we're going to bring all these Mormons, they're going to come in and they're going to be um, living in Yerushalayim and teaching in Yerushalayim and having an effect on the Jewish boys. He says, please get them to stop building. And Menachem Parish called him. Menachem Parish says, I'll give you a blank check. Here's a check. Any amount of money they want, we'll buy the property from them. 
We'll, if they'll close it down, we'll pay any amount of money, we'll do anything that we can in order to be able to get them. So call Rabbi Sher, he's the Rabbi Sher, is the, the go-to guy. All right, Rabbi Sher is the guy who's, who, 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 who Klai Yisrael looked to and said, please help us. Now, it so happens that the Secretary of Education in a previous government, he was, he was retired, he was out of his job at that point, but the Secretary of Education in one of the, the, uh, uh, the, the governments in, in the United States was a Mormon. And Rabbi Sher was very active in representing the yeshivas uh, to the Board of Education, and he developed a very, very close relationship with them. In fact, he, this um, Secretary of Education was honored at an Aguda dinner, mm. and we'll go, go to jump a little bit further in the story, Rabbi Sher ultimately went to Utah, Salt Lake City, and was picked up from the airport by the former Secretary of Education, and he took him to his house, and on his wall was the plaque that he got from Agudas Yisrael, wow. right, in his dining room. So it was a very, very warm relationship that he, and he arranged, I Shara called him up, it's a problem, we want to speak. He arranged for Rabbi Shara to go to the meeting of the elders. They have La Havdil, La Moetis Gdaliatera, people in the 90s, 80s and 90s, and they are the decision makers for the Mormon church. So he said, I'd like to have a meeting. I'd like to make a presentation to them. And the Secretary of Education, former Secretary of Education, arranged it. Rabbi Sherry got on a plane, went to Salt Lake City, was picked up by the secretary, went to his house for a little while, and then he went to the meeting. What are you going to say at the meeting? So he told him the following story. He said he has a friend, who happens to be a friend of mine also. And this friend had three boys and two girls. And one boy, three or four years old, got sick, a rare sickness, didn't know what it was, something in the blood. And took him to the hospital, and he died in the hospital. Mm. And the family sat shiva. And a year later, almost to the day, a second boy got sick. One, two, three, went to the hospital and died. Wow. And they sat shiva again. Bernsham helped, they had another baby. When the baby was one year old, the baby got sick, was in the hospital, and died. Mm. They had a boy, a bar mitzvah boy. I, I went to the bar mitzvah. He got sick, got better. A couple of years later, he was 16 or 17 years old. He got sick, and he died. Wow. He lost four boys, four sons, two girls, Baruch Hashem, alive and healthy. But Rabbi Sher told over the story, and then he said, but that, when one of his daughters gets sick, they go crazy. They don't know what's going to happen the next day. Yeah. They go crazy, but they have a right to go crazy because they had that experience, and that's what happened to them. We Jews lost not four boys. We lost over a million children just a few years ago. A million of our children. We're crazy, but we have a right to be crazy. We don't want to lose one more boy, one more son. And so we're afraid that because you're a missionary group, we're afraid you're going to come to Israel and you might affect one of our, take away one of our children. Maybe it's not right. Maybe you promise you won't. Maybe we're crazy, but we have a right to be crazy. And here's a check, a blank check, any amount of money that you want, give up the property. So they sat back and obviously they were impressed and moved. 
And they said, but Jerusalem and Israel is the capital of the world. Is every religion has, has a site there. I remember what Rashi says, the, the Lamed, why were the 31 kings in, 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 in the Yeshua had to capture? There are 31 kings because every kingdom had to have a site, a site in Yerushalayim. You have, to, mm-hmm. you have to be in Eretz Yisrael. That's, that's mm-hmm. the center of the world. So it's embarrassing that every other religion has a center there and we don't have a center. But we'll tell you what. Give us a place out of Yerushalayim. Someplace in the north, someplace we can say we we're in Israel. Let us build our center over there. And we'll be out of the, the mainstream. We we'll ask him to move. But give us some place where we won't be bothered, where you won't slap us. And Rabbi Shera thought that Baruch Hashem, so he, Baruch gave, him, Shalim, he yeah. gave, gave him a siyat of the Shemaya. And with the siyat of the Shemaya, he said the right thing. He moved them. They respected him. He had the charm. He wasn't coming as an antagonist. People yeah. they were demonstrating in the streets of Yerushalayim against them. So when they came the way a Torah representative goes, and he came to, um, he, he came and, and he convinced them. And they were willing to go someplace else. And he came back and he reported to the Gera Rebbe. And the Gera Rebbe said, no. After all that. We cannot give them any place in Eretz Yisrael. We cannot be Moscow. Even if they're going to build in Yerushalayim, it's not worth it. It can't come with our Haskam. We can't allow it, even if we know that if we don't give them somewhere else and say, like, at least they shouldn't be in Yerushalayim. But so, like, no, we're not allowing this to happen. And we mm-hmm. talk about Rabbi Sher's Yamunas Chachamim and how the decisions are made by Gedele Yisrael. Rabbi Sher flew out to Salt Lake City. He used this context. He had the Siat the Shemai. He used what he had to do, and he convinced them. And the Gedele Yisrael said no, and Rabbi Sher said no. That's it. Uh, I wonder how that phone call went, you know, after that whole beautiful story and this. And yeah. you know, they finally, you know, had an, you know, they were asking him to give up. And then, you know, he calls the next day. He's like, oh, yeah, no. I, I, I said, take it. I said, I can't, what? I, can't, <laughs> I, I can't deliver. Right? Basically, he, he had to come in and he said, I can't deliver. And if he can't deliver, then he's, um, uh, why? Because clearly, Sarah said, no, Rabbi Shera would walk into a meeting. Very often, Chaim Davis Bell tells us tells over the story. He went to there was an issue on on legislation, and he and Chaim Davis Bell discussed it, and they were convinced that this is the way to go. And they went to Gabbat just to you know get get the you know, get the the approval on it. And the Mets clearly Terror said no. We want you to do it differently. And Chaim Davis Bell, a young lawyer, coming on the staff and so on. He was young then. And so on, he was like a little bit disheartened that he figured Rabbi Sher was also disheartened. Rabbi Sher was besimcha. Rabbi Sher said, this is why I came to Agudas Yisrael. Is I'm a president of an organization that doesn't have any power. that can't make any decisions. Is I want to because I know that this is the terror. That this is the way that the that, 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 that Agudas Yisrael has to live. Agudas Yisrael has to, has to the, the decisions of Agudas Yisrael has to be up to Torah. And the Torah people are sitting all day and, and learning Torah. And they're the ones who, who, who have to give us the guidance. And we have to accept it and we have to be happy to accept it. It's so crazy how, you know, like you go and you work and you plan and everything couldn't, you know, you research and then you come to show to Gedele Israel, you know, you have the perfect plan after months of research and everything. And they're like, oh, no, just no, that's not it. Oh, it's they not don't the just, right thing. Like, they, they don't, obviously, it's probably yeah. not that they, they, simple. They, yeah, but. there was the 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 the, the, the unum of the Metzgah Terror very very serious. They hear both sides of a story, and they consider it, and then they give guidance, and mm-hmm. hopefully they have siyat the shmaya, um, and and very often it's it's not, you know, we talked the the other time the, uh, an individual has to. Um, an individual has, has to have a godal that he goes to and he talks to. But when you're talking about a thing, we went, we had a question 
um, probably when it was the director of Project Hope, and there were government cutbacks, and we had to fire people. So the question is, who do we fire? Uh, do we fire the people who are less important, less needed? Do we fire the people who are hired last? Right? In unions, right? first in, last out. If you're hired first, you have more seniority, you don't get hired. Do we consider the people who are, um, the, do we consider the people more in need? If there's a bacher, doesn't really need the job, and somebody else has five children, or ten children, can I know her? And, uh, and he won't get a, get a job someplace else. Do we consider that? So what are the considerations of who, how do we make decisions of um, who, who do we let go if we, ha if we have to let people go? And we normally would have gone to a meeting in the Metz Kedela um to get a decision on that. But it didn't work out technically to get everybody together. So we decided we're going to go to each one separately and try to get direction from them. And I remember a lesson I learned from Rabbi Sarotskin. I remember Rabbi Sarotskin was in New York at the time. And uh, I remember sitting, I have a picture of him sitting in the, Cope, in the Project Cope office. And before we started telling him, we explained to him what we were there for. He said, if you want to ask me my opinion, I'll give you my opinion. But if you think you're getting a decision in the Mexico de Altera by doing a, a, a survey, and you're, that's, you're mistaken. His the decision in the Mexico de Altera is when we sit in one room together and we have our opinions and we express the opinion and we hear whatever somebody else says. And from the conversation comes out a consensus, comes out of very often I'll walk into a menu meeting with one opinion and maybe I would give that to you now. But that's not even if you hear but, another girl, they'll say the tiniest thing. Will change. Right. It? And, and, and it'll explain to me why that's right. He says, so they're, they're serious, the unit, serious discussions is with, with the, the goal, and, and they're on serious topics, on serious topics, serious discussions, and, 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 uh, and, and the effort is put into it. The, 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 uh, I remember Mike Feinstein said, say, you say that the, he, he won't pass in on, on theoretical questions. What would be if this and this, if it's not Lemaisa? Is because the effort that he would put in to Paskin and Shaila was so great, he didn't have the Kaychas for it. Mm -hmm. Also, he didn't have the Siat of the Shmaya. His reverse also said, when we all sit together, he said, there's a certain Siat of the Shmaya that we have to come up with with the terror, the thing that the, the terror wants. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but, 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 no, it's several. Now, not always Rabbi Sher is successful. Um, and sometimes he was stumped. I remember I was in Albany together with Rabbi Shera on a, um, went to some meeting in Albany. And when uh, we came to the airport, he called the office for his messages. And one of the messages that the Russian ambassador had returned his call. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Rabbi Shera was in a phone booth. I don't know if anybody knows what a phone booth is anymore. <laughs> is. In the airport, there were no cell phones. It's a right? museum, yeah, historic right. museum these right? days. <laughs> is this, the, the, we didn't have cell phones. So when you wanted to call, they had like a telephone in a little booth that you went into. Sometimes you get stuck. Someplace you can have milk in the booth also. <laughs> but the, the, uh, is you go into the booth, and uh, when you have milk, you have a direct line to the Shemayim. Ah, okay? yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, you, you're talking you on put, the phone. Yeah. You, put it, you put in a dime or a quarter, or what the case is, and you call and you dial. They used to have dials, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you, you, uh, you dial the phone. Today it's just like, hey, Siri, call <laughs> David Chatzkalovich. And, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, so there we, we, we go to, uh, um, so our share calls the Russian ambassador, and I was standing next to him. Sorry, why, why had he called him? He had called him because I goodest show for many years would send matzis into Russia. We did it through Switzerland, and the Swiss Aguda would pack up matzahs and send it to packages to individuals in Russia. Uh, interestingly enough, the Russian government, when they took the packages, they used to put a note in it, is when they delivered it, because they opened up every package, they wanted to see what was in there. And they put a note, and they remembered to say thank you, that they should send it to you again. They should send you more, mm -hmm. right? So the the uh, all of a sudden, one year, 
We sent the packages, and they got stopped. I guess the Reverend Sherry called the Russian ambassadors the freedom of religion. Russia officially has freedom of religion. Yeah. He said, this is a religious item. How come you're stopping it? <clears throat> so Rabbi Shera started, he said, you know, I'm the uh, president of, of I Go With Israel of America. They started explaining what the organization is. We represent Orthodox Jews, and the ambassador cut him off. He says, you don't have to tell me who I Go With Israel of America is. I know who you are, and I know about your Council of Terrorist Sages, too. How did he know about the Council of Terrorist Sages? A few years before, there were a group of allegedly JDL, Jewish Defense Leagues, people who were starting up with the Russian diplomats. They had a home in Riverdale, and they were shooting them. Hmm. They were taking shots at them, coming there, and they were very upset. And they also knew it was people with yarmulkes. So they were going to take it out on the Jews in Russia, and on the religious Jews in Russia, on the shuls and so on. But Henry Kissinger was the Secretary of State at the time, and Henry Kissinger found out about it, and Henry Kissinger said uh, he'd like to meet with the Council of Terrorist Ages. Henry Kissinger didn't know he was a, 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 a member of um, uh, Ezra Pai, the Pauli in Cyril in, in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. right? he, uh, he actually wrote a, um, we had in the archives, he had written a, in a project he had written um, uh, a, a piece on uh, an essay on uh, mitzvah bo hmm. <laughs> of all of all topics, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, we came. To, so he, he knew. He said he wanted to meet with the Metzger de la Terra. and um, they brought up before the Metzger de la Terra, They didn't want to meet with him, but they said Rabbi Sherry should meet with him and deliver the message. So Rabbi Sherry met with Henry Kissinger. And Henry Kissinger asked that the Metzger de la Terra come out with a statement against either the JDL or certainly against shooting at the Russian diplomats. Roy Sher brought the message back to the Metzger de la Terra. The Metzger de la Terra discussed it, and the Metzger de la Terra agreed that that's not our derech, and it's the wrong thing to do. And they came out with a very forceful um, letter, um, and there were press releases saying that the Council of Terra Sages came out with a um, uh, decree that if there's anybody who's shooting at diplomats, that's not the way we act, that's not the way we deal with government, that's not to deal with, with other governments and can have a, negative effects, and asking the people to stop. And it stopped. Now, I don't know if that had to do with the letter of Moscow Terra mm -hmm. or not. Could be with the Seat of the Shemaya. Uh, yeah. uh, but about. the Russians believed that it was. Mm -hmm. Russian believe it was. So when Rabbi Sher was calling about the masses, he was ready to say, I know about Agudath Israel. Ah, and the and I, know about, the I, know, I, know, I know about I know about your council of Torah sages. And that's why I'm returning your call. And why are you calling me? So Rabbi Sher said, every year before Pesach, we send in religious materials. We send in matzahs. <clears throat> and um, we have... Uh, uh, now we want to send it in, and somehow it got blocked. And it's freedom of religion. So the ambassador was well prepared. And the ambassador said, I have three reasons why it was stopped. First of all, it's embarrassing to us. We're a big country, and we have, quote, freedom of religion. You have to send from the United States the You can't make it here. You well. can't make it here. Is That's... That's number one. Number two, the way the shuls support themselves is they bake matzahs. The matzahs happen to have been chametz. We were aware of it. But they're chametz to get matzahs. And they used to bake and they used to sell. And people used to line up. That was one of the things that kept the Jews. Is that the Jews in Russia, they gave up everything. But biskit on Pesach, they knew they did. He says they didn't know why, yeah, no, what, when. We'll go explain to the ambassador the chametz matzah and this and eighteen minutes and I don't know, matzah here. You know, it's well, what do you need more? You know. So first of all, it's embarrassing for us. He says that you have it. Secondly, he says that we. Secondly, we stopped it because the the parnosa. 
is the shuls have to make, that's the way they make their living for the year, is that they get an allocation of flour, and they bake that flour, and they, they charge money for it, and, 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 and people line up to get it, so, and they pay for it. So that's the way they get the rest of it. The third reason, he said, was open up an advertisement. There was an organization that was advertising um, to raise money to send matzahs to, to Pesach, not a grocery store, a different organization, and they had a barbed wire fence with a matzah crying, is yeah. I'm a hostage, is in Russia, they won't let me have the matzahs, please give me money for it. He says, is that religion or is that propaganda? That's propaganda against us. What do you do now? Yeah. <laughs> how do you respond he's, to he's, that? He's, he's, how do you respond to that? And the, the bottom line is that you also we also realized that the Russians are reading our papers. It's responsible as a responsibility when you put something in writing and you put something in the public, don't think that the enemies, even the Goyim, are not going to be reading, are not going to uh, be careful what you say. I, I wrote an article when they had the three uh, Jewish students who were caught in, in Japan with, with, uh, with Russia, and, and the articles that were written against Japan. So these are the people who have to decide to let them go. Yeah. You need to be friends with them right now if you want them to allow the Bachim to be released. Don't I just think, oh, you know, because it's in the Mishpacha magazine, they won't know about it? Like, exactly. Exactly. So you have to realize that was the... the, the so that was, that was a time that, that uh, uh, again, so you win some, you lose some. Uh, he told he talk they didn't... And, and they didn't let the matzahs in. Mm-hmm. We, so we ended up sending other Pesach goods and, and so on. Ultimately, the, the Iron Curtain came down. Iron Curtain came down, and we were able to have matzah bakeries, kosher matzah bakeries in, in, in Moscow and in Kiev, and, and, and supported, they were able to get matzahs from there. Um, but that's, uh, you know, an, another, another aspect of, um, uh, and, and Rabbi Sher was principled. Um, one of the things we, we didn't get to when we talk about the growth of, of Agudas Yisrael, um, after the independent orthodoxy, one of the things that Rabbi Shera realized was that when it came to social services, we were, again, depending on the non-religious Jews or, or on the Gaim. Somebody needed a job. He needed counseling for a job. Where did he go? He went to the Federation. He went, so we're telling you that Torah is everything. The way to go and is to build Torah, to have Yiddishkeit and Torah. And when you need a job, you have to go to, 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 to the people who are not from. You have to go to, to the Federation. So why don't we develop? And most of the money for it didn't come from its private contributions. Most of the money came from, from the government. The government had social programs. They had social programs, and they gave it to the Federations, and the Federations were servicing our community. So why don't we go directly to the service? If we can go for on, on the issue of aid to non-public schools, if we can represent ourselves, why don't we represent ourselves? Yeah, why don't we need to go in, through in this others? whole why, why system? We have to go the whole system. We can take B'nai Torah, and they can develop develop programs and 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 provide better services than the. So the first thing they did was so senior citizen centers. Is the, the government was giving money to senior citizens. Our senior citizens had to go to a place that maybe was kosher, maybe it wasn't kosher, uh, for, for daycare centers uh, where people went there. And Rabbi Shera spoke to the government, and now he had relationships with the government because of the other things that he was doing. Mm-hmm. And he said, why didn't it give us the grant to be able to provide these services? And they said, you're right. Put in an application and put in an application, and Borough Park Senior Citizen Center, the Brookdale Senior Citizen Center, Flappers, and Bensers, and a number of senior citizens, and where they came where they were able to eat Hashirim, where they were able to be in a firm atmosphere, where they had real kosher food. And so so the, the, the movement was to, to provide, so that was the a, a next generation or the next decade of, of work by Grissi Searle, and then came the very, very important of, of, of getting jobs, employment. His employment, people coming out of yeshivas and so on, they wanted to get jobs, and they needed training. The only way you can get trained is go to college. Not everybody will even go to college. If you don't want to go to college, can you get a job? And the government was giving much, much, large amounts of money for vocational training. So Rabbi Sher went back to the government and said, you know, maybe we can put in an application, and maybe we can get some of those funds to do vocational training is in, 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 in our community and let our community do it. And they got a grant, and I got a call 
uh, Menachem Lubinsky was going to be the director, but there were two grand two programs. One was for for uh, for Project Cope. One was for um, on the job training, and the other one was for vocational education. And I was in St. Louis at the time. I'd, uh, I mentioned, you mentioned her, in the I mentioned first that, episode. That, yeah, that, that I reported that that um, I reported that uh, uh, that that uh, I got a call. They're the starting Project Cope, and they would like me to be the director of vocational education in Project Cope. Yeah, so this is part of that's it's how part, you it's started part of that, in the Aguda. That's and he says, and that's the way I came into the Aguda. And he says, I came into the Aguda to be the director of vocational education, and we were able to hire. And he says, Bnei Tera, to give counseling to help with getting jobs, and we did a better job than 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 than, than, than the We understood the community. We understood yeah, the they're part of the community. They weren't an right. outside party, so they actually like knew what, exactly. what they wanted, what they needed. Exactly, we had job counselors, and we held them testing, and so on. To, the thousands of people went through our doors, and 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 the Russians came, and we were able to service the Russians, the none from Russians. Mm-hmm. Is just, and, and and do it in a better way, and we'll have a hashpa on the Russians. They should see Orthodox Jews are, are are don't have horns, and and they had no no education before. They didn't know what firm Jews were, and here the Russians were coming, and we were able to start a project rise to, for education for them, and 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 do other things, but also provide jobs for them, and, just, and give them and give them job training. And then ultimately started Cope Institute, which was a, a, a training, the school that provided the, the today. They still have PCS as it's a um, the professional career t- s- trainer. So where they, they 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 train people in executive management positions, and so on. Take Benet Terra, and then we found a lot of the people got jobs in um, from Project Cope. Did a better job than the people who went to college degrees. So you can learn a yeshiva. A Jewish mind, yeah. Right? yeah. You can learn a yeshiva and 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 uh, and harava and so on. Become the, and when it times to get a job, six months later you can have a job. You don't have to go four years to college, right? So it's something we provided that our sort of provided for the community. Um, the the uh, but Ed Koch became mayor of New York City, and the first thing that he did was make an executive order, Executive Order Fifty, that any any uh, organization or group that has a contract for with New York City cannot discriminate on the basis of sexual preference. We had to sign in the contract that we're not going to discriminate. We have to recognize everybody's equal. And uh, we cannot discriminate on that basis. In hiring, Jobs, so on. Somebody comes, he says, who wants to, uh, to get a job? We would have to. Uh, so the the Catholics said they weren't going to sign. Unfortunately, a lot of the Jewish groups said, well, we'll do whatever we want. Anyway, we're just writing in the contract. It doesn't mean mm-hmm. anything. And the New York Times ran an editorial and said, why do these other groups not sign? You see, Orthodox Jewish groups are signing. Ah, there also was also there Orthodox, Orthodox Jewish groups that had other contracts. Mm-hmm. And and this is, this is because the Aguda was based in New York, or like it had York, written this, this, in no, every state. This, no, this was in New York. This was the the mayor of New York. The, the contract mm-hmm. was with New York. It was federal funds, but uh, done through the city of New York. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you, you couldn't like change it to a different state or anything, or it was no, too complicated. No, 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 no. The kind of funds and and we were providing the services in New York. Mm-hmm. Areas and it was for New Yorkers. So, yeah, I mean, the, I guess that that's where the the main Jewish community right, in America is. Right. So, and I think it was Mayor Koch, who said that he saw as soon as he saw the editorial in the New York Times that these groups, you know, saying well, the Jewish Jews, he knew Agudas Yisrael was not going to sign. Is when it comes to Kiddush Shem Shemayim, and he goes, we had over two million dollars of contracts. And we said, we'll give up to Rabbi Shera under his leadership after discussing with the Gedele Yisrael. We'll give up the $2 million of contracts. We'll give up the services to the Lemonator. We'll give up the services that we have, which are very valuable. But if it's a matter of principle, we're not going to give it. And we took him to court. We took New York City to court. And um, in the end, we won. Wow. We won, we won, we won, and we were able to do it, and we, the, the, uh, um, they wrote a language that we were able to accept. 
Well, it was to change the contract. Yeah, written in the contract. It was right in the contract that you take this contract, you take this $2 million to provide these services. It was, it was a, mm-hmm. it was a contract. But, but it was the specific contract with the Aguda or was the it's, whole no, way it's how contract the whole... With, it's contract with the Aguda. Oh, it was specifically with the Aguda. Right. It wasn't like the whole the how sal- the New York the, State The work. other organization was the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army took, uh, stood on principle. The mm-hmm. Catholics stood on principle. And, 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 and they had... Did they also get some type of deal or... No, it wasn't a deal. It was we took them to court and they had to settle out of uh, court. No, I'm saying, but the yeah, Catholics, they, yeah, they also they, did they, the they, same? They also, they, they, they stood on principle. Mm-hmm. They stood on principle, but, you know, the, a number of the other Jewish groups were ready to were ready to compromise. And Rabbi Sher said, no, we have to listen to Agdalim. And if Agdalim said, we have to stand on principle, we're going to stand on principle and lose a $2 million contract. The reason we had this little jump was because it is three weeks later from the earlier recording. Uh, so this episode is three weeks. We are working on it, you could say. I mean, okay. not really, because we're had, working a lot longer than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just to finish off this episode about Reb Shara's incredible, you know, the stories with the Italian mafia and, you know, suing and winning New York State and uh, more and more. Um, but maybe share with us uh, one more story of Rabbi Moshe Sher, something, you know, a major project that he was involved with. Uh, actually, we start, we can, there was, there was an interesting episode, an interesting story, which will lead us in to a whole new project that I could just show got involved in. Um, we had, during that time, uh, the Russian government, the communist government was in power and there were prisoners of conscience, people who wanted to go to Eretz soil and wanted to leave, and the government put them in jail. The, the made life very, very difficult for them. One of these people, one of the famous people, was Yosef Mendelevich. Yosef Mendelevich was part of a group that tried to hijack a plane in order to get to Israel. And they caught them, and they put them into jail. And in jail, he learned what it meant to be a Jew. And I would, during those years, we, we had gotten story, heard stories about him, and, and we talked about how he had a Seder in jail, how he kept Shabbos in jail, how, all the different things that he did in the Russian prisons, how he was able to, um, to, 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 to live a life of, of, of Torah and Yiddishkeit and learn about Yiddishkeit. And there was somebody who actually sent him letters every week, not even knowing whether the letters are going to get there. And every week he wrote about the parasha. And most of the letters didn't get there, but he was there a number of years. So from the t- he kept on writing year after year after year, Yosef Mendelevich was able to put together all the parishes of the Torah. He had a whole, almost like a chumash. Every week he could read about the parish. Very, very interesting wow. stories, a fascinating stories about Yosef Mendelevich. Rabbi Sherry got a call from the sister of Yosef Mendelevich. His parents had applied for visas to go to Israel. They lost their job and so on, as, as, as was typical then. And they were waiting for the for the, the, the permission. Finally, they got permission. They got permission, they got 30 days to leave the country, and they were able to go out to be able to leave for Israel. During that time, Mr. Mendelevich, Yosef Mendelevich's father, was Nifta. So he was waiting all these years to try to get there to Israel, and then HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided that he, his, his mother at least wanted to take him for Kevin Yisrael. He should be buried in Eretz Yisrael. She went to spoke to the commissar. We can't go alive, but we have this permission to go. Can, can I take his coffin and go to, to, to Eretz Yisrael? And they said, yet. No, no way. It has to be buried here. And they were distraught. And Joseph Mendelevich's sister, who lived in Eretz Yisrael, called Rabbi Sher and said to Rabbi Sher, can you help to try to get my father to come to Kebbe Yisrael. Rabbi Sher at that time was very close to Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger had been the, the Secretary of State in the United States. He had, re- he had retired then, but he was very close to many of the people in the Russian embassy. And Rabbi Sher at that time, no emails, no uh, uh, faxes even, at that time typed up a letter and had a secretary deliver the letter to Henry Kissinger in Washington with all the details. Henry Kissinger took it into the Russian embassy. He came out, and Rabbi Sher spoke to him, and he said, they didn't say no. That's a good sign, because usually they'll just say no. So they didn't say no, but try. 
So Mrs. Mendelevich went to the commissar a day or two, three later, and said, can I have permission to go? I said, yeah. No, you can't. A couple of days later, they called again, Rabbi Sher, what should we do? The deadline was coming. They had to be out by a certain date, and they were three days before the deadline. So Rabbi Sher called Henry Kissinger again, and he said, look, I did what I could. Go to the commissar. Either they'll do it or they don't do it. There's nothing now more, it's up not, to them. There's nothing, else to them. There's nothing more than we can do. The day before they were supposed to get, they had to leave, and Mrs. Mendelovich had to leave. The day before that, she came back to the commissar, and she said, of course, Mrs. Mendelovich, if you'd like him to go, no problem. You can delay it a few days if you need it, whatever you need. For so you know the right people in the right time, uh, that, that can have an effect. The Rabbi Sherer remembered with, with emotion the call that he got from Yosef Mendelevich's sister from Eretz Yisrael saying, he says, Baruch Hashem, I was able to bring my father to Kev Yisrael with tears in her eyes. What, what happened that like such a change from no, no, every day to all They did a favor for Henry Kissinger. Mm -hmm. They had a good relationship and they were able to get the message finally got to the commissar that it's in the interest of the Russian government, and they wanted to do it, and they, that's the way very often Tevis help mm -hmm. the people one hand washes Under the other. Under the table, you help the me, table, I have you, your favors. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So that's why. Rabbi Sher got a letter from Roshach about a year or two later, saying, Hamas will be mitzvah, Omer lo gemur. You started with this mitzvah with helping out the family. Maybe you'll continue it and speak to Henry Kissinger that he should take, he should get Yosem Mendelevich out of jail. Like Yosem Mendelevich be able to go to Israel. Rashi had a problem. Henry Kissinger at that time was considering running for the Senate in New York State. And if he ran for the Senate and Rabbi Sherry asked him for a lot of favors, he'll have to support him. And Henry Kissinger was married to a non-Jew. He was a Jew married to a non-Jew. He had grown up in, in, in a firm family hmm. in, in Germany. He was a member of Ezra Pai, the Aguda Youth Movement. And, but now he had intermarried. He, he came to America only after the Holocaust? He came to America, I think before, I'm not sure, before, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before. But now Rabbi Sheriff, if I'm supporting him, it's going to be Chil Hashem. If I ask him for too many favors, I ask them for one favor, that's not a problem. But if I ask them for too many favors, that can mean that I'll have to support him. And if I support him, it's be a chil Hashem. So, but Rav Shach asked him to do it. And there also, it wasn't the type of getting back and forth to be able to come. He said, Rabbi Shera went to Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. And he asked Rav Chaim, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky what to do. And he said, you can't do it. He says, you can't, if you feel that this is going to be called lead to a chil Hashem, then you can't do it. I remember the exact word. I don't remember the exact words that he said. I do remember, though, that later when Rabbi Sher was in Eretz Yisrael, and he went to Rav Shach, and he explained to Shach, to Rav Shach the, the situation, Rav Shach used the same words that Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky used to tell them that under those circumstances, you don't have to go and get them. However, Circumstances developed, and Yosem and Levitch got out. Other texts, people went, he said, Baruch Hashem, he was able to get out. When he came out, he came to New York. He came to Ontario, to Seoul, but he, he had a trip to, 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 to New York, and he came and he asked for an appointment with Rabbi Shera. And he came to Rabbi Shera, and he asked him for, uh, he wanted to call, I want to thank you for what you did for my father. I want to thank you for the help that you were able to get to Kevin Yisrael. But then he told him something. He said, do you know that there is a Balchuva movement in Russia? Do you know that there's a fellow by the name of Elia Esas who had a history by himself, his parents, also his mother learned in Yavna, but in their house there wasn't a Jewish letter. They were afraid. They were afraid to, 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 to show anything Jewish. Elia Esas learned nothing Jewish in his youth. And when he wanted to get into university, he was refused to go to the university because he's an Evrei, because he's Jewish. And he said to his parents, what does that mean? So he went to the library, and he read 
the history of the Jews, a book, the history of the Jews by, by Gretz, a, non, non, a secular history. And he came back to his parents and he said, we had such a rich heritage. You cheated me of it. You didn't give me the opportunity to know that, that, that I'm Jewish. And he started studying. He went to Moscow. He got a book, Elif Milim. Right? Elif Milim. Is, and he came back speaking Hebrew. Wow. It was it's like the kids' book? The kids' book, the kids book right? Thousand words. With thousand words. words. Then Odell of Milam, another thousand yeah. words. He says, you learn Hebrew? He could get that book. Ultimately, he went to the yeshiva in Moscow, which he saw was a fraud. He says it was just a show place. Well, but what do you mean by that? What, what yeshiva was this? They had officially, they wanted to show that they have freedom of religion in, in communist Russia. So they took 10 people together and they said, this is the yeshiva. But they... they no, it was from they, the Russian government. The Russian, right? Russian government. It was Russian mm -hmm. government. So he thought he was going to go to yeshiva. He's going to learn about Judaism. He, he saw that, that it wasn't there. So he heard that there was something called Parshas HaShavua. To read the Parshas HaShavua. And he thought that he's going to study. He's going to get a few friends together. We had seven people together and they started learning the Parsha Shavu with the Ramban. Mm -hmm. so it, there wasn't any actual yeshivas in there Russia? There wasn't any actual yeshivas in, in Russia. No place to learn Torah. It was, it was forbidden to learn Torah. Mm -hmm. So he got they seven people. made this place to show, oh, see, we're, we're not banning uh, Judaism. We have a yeshiva. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So he started teaching and he taught the seven. He, he said later when he came out, he said that if he would have realized with learning Chumash Ramban, what that is, he knew that, that, that he wasn't up to it. But they were bright fellows and they started studying and they learned the, um, the, the, they, they learned the, the, the Parsha Shavua and it was the beginning of Dvorim and Moshe Rabbein was talking about it on his last days and he felt it was talking to them. And he was like, Kodesh Baruch was talking to them. And he says, I'm leaving you. And I want you to go to Eretz Yisrael. And I want you to, to keep my mitzvahs. And, and these seven individuals started teaching seven other individuals. Each one made their own group. Um, Baruch Ludmir, my son-in-law's uh, brother-in-law, right, yeah. was one of those seven people that he started with. But wow. each one of them started growing and growing and started developing. But they had nobody to teach them. They were all studying by themselves. So Yosef Mendelevich came to Rabbi Sherah and said, Rabbi Sherah, there's this movement and this sort of interest in learning Torah, but there's nobody to teach them. Agudis Yisrael just thought a project to start sending Rabbonim and teachers and people to go in and to teach them Torah. To teach these seven people Torah so they could spread it right. to, to others. Right. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we had just had the, in 1980 was the, the Knesset Gedolah. At the Knesset Gedolah, we had elected chairman of committees. One of the committees was Hatzola Committee. He used to work with Jews in oppressed lands. And Mordechai Nushtat was chosen to be the chairman of that committee. So Rabbi Sherek called Mordechai Nushtat and myself in. And he had Yosef Mendelevich explain to us what was going on. And right then we decided that we we're going to work on a project which ultimately became the Vanat Zolson of Yisrael, to be able to teach, send people into Russia and to teach. And it was a fascinating thing. Mark Hindushtet went himself. He met with Elie Essas. He came back with, with the whole story. And, and, and we started working every month. We should try to get two new people to go in as tourists. To go in tourists and, and to go and, 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 and there. But to meet, you know, they have a little interest in the Jewish community. Had to be very careful. They were always followed. There was all records of who went and whether it was all in the Russian government. They knew what was going on, but they had to be careful. Certain things they were allowed to do, certain things they weren't allowed to do. But it was fascinating was that you had people who had tremendous rotsen, they won a tremendous will, but no knowledge, no understanding, and no way to teach them. So, for instance, Mendel Goldberg and Chaim Septimus were a pair that went, second or third group that went. And they went, and for Shabbos, they were in Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg, was St. Petersburg. During the communists, they called it Leningrad. And on um, the Shabbos, they came to the house of the Shochet. And the Shochet in this kitchen, the Shochet of chickens, and in this ch kitchen, he's taking this, what, the, his, his wife is taking off the feathers, and they're going, the blood's flying all over, and so on. There are two people, two young men there, and the two young men said, uh, you know, hurry up, hurry up. So Mendel Goldberg asks 
these two fellows, you know, what's going on? So they said, well, there's a bris tomorrow morning. And we came from Moscow to Leningrad. We said, well, Moscow, there were no chickens. So we came from Moscow to Leningrad to try to get chickens for the bris, because usually even on Shabbos, they ate only milchiks. There was no food at that time. Wow. Forget, well, about kosher, forget about kosher food. Forget about kosher food. There was yeah. no food. So they they went to get they, they went to get chicken with was a bris. So a bris, they came, uh, they trained by train from, from Moscow to Leningrad, and they went to get, they came to the Sheikhit to get two chickens and to bring it back for this bris, the Sudas bris. And the train left, the last train left at a certain time. So they were rushing the Sheikh. Uh, they're after, rushing they're rushing, uh, they're, the back. Russians were rushing, right, <laughs> to, 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 to get back. Because they had to get on the train. Because they had to go to Moscow the next morning with the bris. So Mendel Gobri says, oh, Mazel Tov, who's the father? Is it the, who's, uh, who, who's making the bris? Said, uh, oh, this is uh, no father. What's the story? It was their bris. They were having the bris the next morning. Wow. And they wanted the chickens, he says, for their soothers bris. So they came from Moscow to Leningrad to get the chickens. It was, it was a few days before Pesach. Why were you rushing? If you're bris, you can do it. It's not the eighth day. You can yeah. do it, right? Why are you rushing? Because it was a week before Pesach, and they learned that if somebody doesn't have a bris, he can't eat the carbon Pesach. And they weren't sure whether you're allowed to eat matzah. And they wanted to eat matzah. So they came from Leningrad, from Moscow to Leningrad to get chickens for a bris so they can have the bris tomorrow that they should be able to eat matzah. It's crazy. And when I told the story to Rav Rudiman, Rav Rudiman said they were machavan to the Gemara. And the Gemara is a half of me in the Gemara. He says, maybe an oral cannot eat matzah. Ah. And the Gemara says he can. The fact is that he can. But they had nobody to ask. So you see this tremendous mysterious nefesh and the tremendous will to want to do the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to re- relate to the Jewish community and become a part of, of Yiddishkeit and Torah and Yiddishkeit. They saw this, this uh, as we mentioned yesterday, with, there was a group of, uh, of Russians uh, over, uh, over the Shabbos meal. He says, uh, as Reb Shner Kotler told, I think it was Mendel Goberg and, 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 uh, and Chaim Septimus, before their trip, they went to visit Reb Shner. Reb Shner was in the hospital. He was sick at the time. And they asked him, and they said, what message should I give to Russian Jewry? And he said to them, you're the greatest proof of the Nitzchus of Kali Yisrael, the eternity of Kali Yisrael. In Russia, in the communism, in everything, block out. You can't learn Torah, you can't have everything. And yet people this, the people learn Torah and people... Yeah, so it's are, like they're risking their lives, right? It's not I, just uh, so, so that, you know, they didn't grow up with it. Their parents didn't tell them till, till they were a little older when they were kids, sometimes even older. And then just like, you know, just to go after and to learn and to study and see, you know, to travel all the way there and to rush back with the train just just because of stuff like the thing, oh, if you're not allowed to eat carbon Pesach, maybe you're not allowed to, to eat matzah. It's like, right. to, to, it's, it's so crazy to, to, to hear exactly. and see. It's... Exactly. So this developed into the Vat Hatzon in the Yisrael. And this was a project started by the Aguda, as the Aguda ultimately became an independent project, became bigger, wider than the Aguda, and bigger than the Aguda, to send in teachers, to send in Rabbonim. There was an Aguda convention where Rabbi Pinchas Goldschmidt, the Rav of Moscow, and Rabbi Yaakov Blach, the Rav of Kiev, came and they spoke about the wonderful work that Vat Hatzon in the Yisrael is doing. But there's so much more that has to be done. And now the Iron Curtain is open, and we're able to teach Torah openly, and we have to do more, and Ruven Dessler and a group of others came and started Operation Open Curtain. The results of Aratzit Marisoral and Operation Open Curtain, thousands, thousands of Russian B'nai Torah and families is today in Eretz Yisrael, in America, all over the world. It, says it came from that little nucleus, that little group that Elias has started and was nourished by people coming, the Agudas Yisrael sending people, and Vatatel Sinti Yisrael and Operation Open Curtain sending people, summer camps, other things, so many things that are going on today that we can be so proud of. He says, so this was one of the, the highlights, I would think, of the career of the later years of, uh, of Rabbi Shera that Agudas Yisrael was involved in. 
And is it the, the taco? Because I remember you said also they had with the Iran that they're rescuing people after the Iron uh, Curtain came down. Was it also has to do with rescuing and bringing people out of Russia? Or then already it was allowed or they needed to get visas? Right. Then it was allowed, but it was made. But then they started coming to Eretz er, er, and they came to America. In America, they started Project Roy's, where Ephraim Moritz traveled from, a, a master educator, he came back from her, who had settled in Eretz Yisrael, he came back to America for a few years to set up a program for education for, for Russians in America. Um, in Eretz Yisrael, projects went on, it, was, it, it became open, became available, and became available, people got into, in, in, into the battle. He says to bring back a whole shave it, that was a shave that, that otherwise it was almost lost. The Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky came back from Russia it, it, many years before then, uh, before this all happened, and, and was crying because his sister is almost didn't remember Shema Yisrael. I right? didn't re remember Hebrew. He was, he, he was, there was so lost, he felt there was a, a shave that was lost and, and found, and found back, and, and I go to Yisrael through the work of people like Martha Hendershta and Rubin Dessler, and in the leadership of Rabbi Shera, we were able, and, and whole committees and, and, and groups of, of people got involved and were able to work, brought, brought back all these, uh, these Jews had the schus of bringing back a shave at the Kali Yisrael. Was it talk that most of the Jews, like they became Bali Tshuva, the ones that at least, you know, discovered and knew, because I'm sure that probably a lot of Russians who, you know, the parents didn't tell them and they, you know, they don't know that they're Jewish, but the people who did know were most of them like became Balat Shuva or? No, it was just there was a small nucleus that became Balat Shuva and they taught others. But the, we, we live in, in the, you live in, in, in Eretz Yisrael and you see the results of the Russians who, who did not have the, the only place where you have uh, um, the treif meat and so on in, the, the, in Eretz Yisrael come out as in the Russian communities. The Russian communities can't blame them they had no education. And also, there was intermarriage. It's a terrible amount of intermarriage. Where we talked about in Iran, there was hardly any intermarriage. In Russia, it was rampant. So it was rare that you had people who didn't have Russian. And when they started coming to Eretz Yisrael, you had the problem of Mia Yehudi, right, who was a Jew. Well, yeah, there was the right? whole, there was the whole tumult, about, that, yeah. the whole balagan to, to bring in Russians, not Russians. Right? Yeah, if they're and, Jewish, they're and, not Jewish. And today, unfortunately, we have many, many Russians who are not Jewish who were sitting in the classrooms with Jewish boys and girls who were serving in the Israeli army without a difference, without knowing that they're really, that they're, they're really not Jewish. And the has for shown problem of intermarriage in Eretz Yisrael also. So it, it, it's a serious problem. On the other hand, there were many who were saved and many who, who were taught and many of these are going and teaching others. That is it for today. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something new. Hope you're able to put something in your pocket for life. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to give us a thumbs up and share it with a friend so they can enjoy it as well. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you're listening so you never miss another episode. Also, go check out our website, jfoundations.com. We have other podcasts, videos, shiurim, Torah writings, and much more. If you have any questions on today's episode or on any one of the other episodes, send an email to info at jfoundations.com or WhatsApp plus 972-55711-6220. We're going to have a short break now till after Sukkot, but then we are going to be back with great content. Thank you for listening. Hope you have a wonderful day. We will be back after Sukkot with the next episode.